Hey, so I thought before starting this video, I would do a little bit of a preface to it. Um, I'm a huge fan of the Transformers franchise. I have been since I was a kid, and it's one of those that for some reason in the fandom stirs up a little bit of controversy as to whether or not it's truly an anime. Um, the purest definition of anime, as far as Japan is concerned, is if the cartoon was created in Japan, it's an anime. Uh, but not so, because there are weebs of all levels out there who have many opinions on the Transformers specifically, because the cartoon was actually based on an American toy line. That happened a lot in the 80s and 90s. The toy would come out first, and the cartoon would follow to sell the toy line. Makes sense, right? Money's got a money. Um, well, Hasbro sent the rights overseas to actually do the animating, and that's why Transformers looks like an anime, because it was animated in Japan. So to me, I call it anime. And when I was first getting into anime on purpose and not just those accidental shows uh, that you found out later as an adult were anime all along, and it's like, oh, okay, I've always been a fan. But when I was getting into it on purpose when I was younger, I ran across uh, the Japanese version of the Transformers. I think the Japanese vocals, I think, were recorded before the English vocals were. And it sounded interesting to me. I typically like my anime subbed. I like a subtitle. I like to hear things in the original language, but maybe because it's an American toy line um, and it's got that more American feel to it, it just sounded right in English for some reason. It's like the only anime that I like um, in English instead of the original language. There's very few anime that I want to watch subbed. Um, I'm sorry, I said that in reverse. That I would want to watch um, dubbed instead of subbed. So that's coming. I'm going to refer to this as an anime. You refer to it however you want to. And let's be friends in the comment. Okay, so yeah, now let's get into the review. Transformers! I'm not going to use that, or maybe I will embarrass myself on the internet. <laughs> hey friends, it's me, the Ebony Otaku, the well-rounded nerd. Today, I want to dive into one of my all-time favorite anime franchises, The Transformers. I have literally been obsessed with The Transformers since I was like five years old. I am a child of the 90s, born in the 80s, you know, raised in the 90s, like a true millennial in every sense of the word. Um, and The Transformers was one of those early introductions into anime that kind of snuck in. And our parents didn't know it was anime before, like they thought anime was something that it's not. Anyway, that's a whole other discussion for another video. Um, but my first recollection of the Transformers was Gen 1 and Gen 2 it used to come on Saturday morning every single week and me and my brother would get you know the cereal in the giant bowl with way too much milk some snacks we'd plop down on the living room floor just eager to watch all the Saturday morning cartoons and in that lineup you had the things like you know the Dino Saucers, G.I. Joe, I'm really dating myself now, G.I. Joe, the GoBots, if anyone remembers the knockoff Transformers, and of course, the greatest of all time, the Transformers. And what's really unique for me about this show is typically when I watch anime, I want it dubbed. I like hearing it in the original Japanese voices. And same thing with any film, honestly. If it's filmed in French, I want to hear it in French because that's the proper voice for the character. You know, it takes a lot of work to match a character to a voice. If it's filmed in Korean, I want to hear it in Korean. You know, if it's filmed in English, I want to hear it in English. Um, and I have no problem with subtitles. But I guess because of the subject matter and the nature of this tick particular show being robots that don't, they're humanoid robots, but they're not human. And it doesn't really matter as much what their voices are. This is like the one show that I prefer in English. They did the voice matching so well, especially in the Transformers movie, which we'll talk about that child traumatizing movie some other day. <laughs> you know, you know, that, that one broke every eight year old. <laughs> in the world when it came out with the death of Optimus Prime. Um, 
but I prefer this one in English. And, you know, what's really great about being a nerd right now, being in this otaku world today, is a lot of the properties we loved as kids are coming back in new forms. And I'm all for it. I said it in a couple of videos now. I love a reboot and a remake. If you have something new to say, something fun to add, just reviving it for a different generation, that's cool. Because most of what I love and adore is probably a remake or revival of something my parents or grandparents love. That's how this works. You just keep reinventing stories for the next generation. And I'm into it because it gives me more action figures to buy and more nerdy stuff to wallow in. So I don't see a problem with any of it. I was debating how I wanted to start off my discussion of Transformers, because like Sailor Moon, it's one of those that I could literally talk about for the next five days and not run out of material, but nobody wants to watch a video that long, so I won't do that to you. Uh, you know, the question is where to start, where to start? You know, do I show them my action figure collection first, which is rather extensive? Uh, do I go into the movie? Do I talk about the Gen 1, Gen 2 series? Well, the Netflix gods smiled upon me, and they have sponsored uh, a new series, a trilogy, The War for Cybertron. And as a longtime fan of the Transformers, not just in the anime form, but the figures, uh, I did read some of the comics when I was younger, but I you know, haven't kept up with that as an adult because, you know, there's always so much nerdity you can fit into your life when you're a whole working adult. <laughs> um... But the War for Cybertron series uh, came out last year, and it's on its second installment of the trilogy now. So I thought, you know what? This is the modern take on the Transformers. This will be a good place to start. Maybe I can connect with all the generations over this version. So let's talk about it. The War for Cybertron as the title implies, takes place on Cybertron, which I love because of all of the Transformers mythology. Uh, what fascinated me most was the origin of the Transformers with the Quintessons, where Cybertron came from, how it was formed, and how this whole sentient robot society came to be, and how it functioned. And, you know, how did the war between the Autobots and the Decepticons start, and who's really the protagonist, and who's really the antagonist? And that's what I I love about this iteration it kind of raises into question who should we really be rooting for so I digress let's start from the very beginning so as we all know history's wit written written <laughs> history is written uh, by the victors typically whoever won the war they're the ones who get to say how the war went and when you're first introduced to this franchise we are supposed to be rooting for the Autobots I mean with a name like Decepticon how can you root for them the name is pure evil <laughs> so of course you're not supposed to root for them uh, they are in war uh, on Earth. They are a sentient robot species that came from Cybertron after their own great war. They crash land on Earth millions upon millions of years ago uh, during the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, they all get knocked out, lose energy, and then one day, millions of years later in modern times, there's a volcanic eruption that shakes one of them awake and the onboard computer Teletran 1 Wow, I'm a nerd. Teletran 1 um, starts scanning for life forms outside of the ship and realizes the world is different and starts remolding the Transformers' bodies to match this modern world. Well, it doesn't just wake up the Autobots. It wakes up the Decepticons who were on board chasing down the Autobots <laughs> when it crashed. So this war is now on Earth, and that's where you pick it up in the Gen 1, Gen 2 series. Well, the Autobots are all altruistic in the series, and you're supposed to root for them. They're the ones who are protecting the humans. They're protecting the planet. They don't want the Decepticons to do to Earth what they did to Cybertron. And the Decepticons, their only real goal is to get back to Cybertron. <laughs> like, that's it. They want to collect enough energy from the resources of Earth uh, to either power a ship or build a space bridge connection to get them back to Cybertron so they can go back to being the rulers of Cybertron. That's like their whole end game. As a kid, I was like, oh my God, those bad Decepticons, they're terrible. You, you get them, Optimus Prime. But now that I'm watching the War for Cybertron series, it's kind of like, so what had happened? What had happened here? 
Uh, and we're only going in the context of the show, not the comics. So don't at me in the comments talking about this is what happened in the manga or this is what happened in the comments. I know. We're talking about this. <laughs> we're not talking about that <laughs> today. Um, so now the War for Cybertron series is kind of a prequel to all of that happening. I kind of wished it had gone back further in the history of Cybertron. We're getting it in bits and pieces, but seeing that fully functioning robot society would have been super cool. But you get glimpses of what that looked like. And some characters that didn't get introduced until Generation 2 show up earlier now, and we get to see the role that they played in the war. So we are dropped right into the middle of the battling on Cybertron. The Autobots are taking a beating from the Decepticons. Megatron is the self-installed emperor of Cybertron, and all he and his Decepticon minions are doing are hunting down anyone who's not a Decepticon and either forcing them to convert to their side or they get executed. Those are your choices. This is a kid's show. <laughs> Do y'all parents watch what your kids are watching? I'm just saying, this is... Oh, I'm telling too many secrets now. I'm going to stop. <laughs> but Megatron's the ruler. And Optimus Prime is on the other side from Megatron. He's the leader of the Resistance, the Autobots, who do not want Megatron to have sole control over the planet and all of the Transformers. And they have two factions that are at war. Now at this point in Cybertronian history, the Decepticons are winning. They are winning good. They are living their, okay, not their best lives, but if they win the war, they can fix some things. The problem is war has torn the planet apart and it's coming to a head because both sides don't have all of the resources they need. The Autobots are having to steal the Energon that powers their bodies wherever they can find it. Um, and the Decepticons are hoarding what Energon is left, but they're running out of it too. So it goes from being a war of supremacy on the planet to just a war for survival. But where this series shines is giving us a little bit of that background detail as to why these sides are fighting. Not just that they're fighting and you're supposed to root for the good guys and hate the bad guys, but why is the conflict happening? You know, a lot of times in wars and the things that happen in history, not to get overly political, but since history is written by those that win, we are told through the manuscripts, through the annals of time, who we should have rooted for without considering the perspective of the other side and what this may have meant to them. And that's what you're getting in the war for Cybertron. Why were the Decepticons revolting? Why did they take over Cybertron? Well, hashtag spoiler warning, I'm going to tell you. So this is the part where you either leave or just come along for the ride. It's up to you. So this is kind of hard, you know, especially since we got out of Black History Month and I got to talk about this topic, but whatevs. Uh, the Decepticons were an enslaved race on Cybertron, it turns out. And it was kind of like that Greek Roman style slavery. So not only were they doing all of the work for the uh, two bits, the favorites of the creators, the creators of the Quintessons. So from now on, I'm just going to say Quintesson, the favorites of the Quintessons. Uh, but they also put them into gladiatorial combat as well, Colosseum style. So the ones that weren't doing the servitudes, they would get thrown into the arena and, you know, slaughtered basically, or have to fight to the death. So they're living pretty miserable lives. Not only that, but they have to mine Energon as well for all the peoples. And if you are the slave class, well, obviously you're not gonna get all you need, just enough to keep you functioning so that you can keep fulfilling the role that they want for you. Um, but then all the good life goes to the Autobots. And as we go through this series and Optimus Prime and Megatron have moments where they meet face to face, little bits of this come out a piece at a time. And Megatron, it turns out, is the slave that rose up and got all the peoples who were also enslaved to rise up with him, overthrow the Quintessons, and then put down the Autobots. And that was initially called 
the rebellion. Well, the rebellion has not be, is not a rebellion anymore. It's the ruling force on the planet. And by force, the Decepticons want everyone who was in that ruling class to join with them and see their point of view. And the Autobots who believe they were living in a peaceful existence on Cybertron, because for them, life was good. They had nothing to fight about. They were the ruling class. We're just, we're just gonna let that sit for a second. They were the ruling class and didn't think anything needed to change. And when those who served them rose up to take over and create chaos and war, they didn't receive that very well. Because from the Autobot perspective, you're destroying my home. You're destroying my life. You're taking from me everything I love. Why are you doing this? From the Decepticon perspective, I was subjugated. I was a slave. I will not be your slave any longer. If you will not give me freedom, I will take my freedom. And then I'll take from you what you took from me. So you have these two opposing forces that believe they're the ultimate good. I'm not going to tell you which one is good or not. I just think it's an interesting discussion. It's a different perspective. So as we go through the war for Cybertron, we're introduced to different characters. One thing I love about this iteration is you get to see more of the female Autobots. <laughs> you get to see Alita One, RC, Moon Racer, um... And what's the other one's name who I keep forgetting? Chromia. <laughs> uh, and I have all those action figures. I'm so excited. I'm going to do an unboxing video with them, but I just, ee -ee, I'm so happy I have all the female Autobots now. But you get to see the female Autobots and you get to hear about their history and how they're connected to their counterparts, the male Autobots, um, why they were created differently uh, from them. You get to hear about the lore of Cybertron and we're dropped into the middle of the Autobots searching for Energon. They've gone from warring to really let's let's live. Can we live? Can we at least get enough Energon to make it to tomorrow? And to find that Energon, they need someone who's not on either side to help lead them there because there are still Transformers who haven't picked Autobot or Decepticon. And one of those is the fan favorite, Bumblebee. Okay, pause here. Okay, I know why his name was Bumblebee on Earth, but how could his name be Bumblebee in space? There aren't Bumblebees in space. This is not a planet of organic life. I am overthinking it and taking the fun out. <laughs> so they meet Bumblebee, and Bumblebee isn't on anyone's side. Bumblebee is his own transformer, <laughs> you know, and all he wants is to get along and not be caught up in any war. So he leads the Autobots to some Energon that's being guarded by some Decepticons. And then he's like, peace, <laughs> I'm not part of this. And they're like, you're not gonna help us? He's like, no, I'm not gonna help you. I said, I get you here, pay me and I'll be on my way. I, I like Bumblebee, I feel you Bumblebee. I don't wanna be in your mess. Pay me what you owe me. I showed you where the goods are. Holla at your boy, <laughs> you know? And that's all he cares about. Well, Optimus Prime, being the proselytizer that he is of the good news of the Autobots, wants him to make a choice to join. Why, why haven't you picked a side? You got to pick a side. Um, and Bumblebee doesn't want to pick a side because he doesn't even understand what the war is about. He just wants to live his life and be left alone. And isn't that like the most relatable thing ever? When you have sides telling you what you should think and how you should feel and how you should react. And no matter what you think, feel, or how you react, it's not right. It's not good enough. And you just want to be left alone to live your life. Got too real there second for a Transformers video. <laughs> well, of course it can't be left that way. The Autobots, you know, they go in to steal their, their Energon. The Decepticons are alerted. Battle ensues. You know, thankfully for the Autobots, they make it back to their hidden home base on Cybertron that the Decepticons are desperately searching for and cannot find. Well, then we're introduced to more characters because Megatron is not exactly happy when Autobots escape. He's gotten a lot of them, but he ain't got all of them and he ain't got Prime. And this is where we meet Starscream. He's one of those love him or hate him characters. He's like super annoying. His voice is terrible, but eh, 
I get where he's coming from. Starscream, somehow, with all of his weirdness, is Megatron's second in command. And that's probably why he keeps him second in command, because he knows if he doesn't keep him on a short leash, he's going to run off and do the most without him. Um, so Starscream, after seeing that the Autobots got away yet again, you know, has no problem saying stuff in front of Megatron and in front of the minions. Like, that's one thing you don't do. You don't admonish your leader in front of the underlings. That's not how we maintain power. <laughs> and Megatron, of course, is always threatening him. And Starscream seems to not care. But, you know, he's like, you know what? You're going you're gonna to talk all this trash, Starscream? Go out there and find them and bring them back. So he sends Starscream and the other aerial bots off to try to find this base that they've been looking for forever. <laughs> now... I'm not going to go episode by episode. I don't know if I ever will with this series, but that's how it all starts. And a lot of the series, honestly, is wash, rinse, repeat. We have no Energon. Let's go find them. Oh, the Decepticons are guarding it. Well, they're going to attack us. Boom, boom, pow, pow, flashes back of why the war is. Uh, let's fast forward three quarters of the way through this season of War for Cybertron. So it becomes known uh, to Optimus Prime and Megatron right around the same moment that the AllSpark, a mythical piece of technology that has the ability to create mechanical life and provides the stability for Cybertron, isn't a myth, it's real. And it's somewhere on the planet. And he who can control the AllSpark can control Cybertron. Well, guess what they do? <laughs> Optimus Prime gets a group of his last, you know, warriors together to go off into the most dangerous part of the planet and try to get the AllSpark and Megatron sends some of his minions off to chase him. And the part of Cybertron they roll into, I mean, if you're going to have a super powerful thing that controls all the things, it's going to be pretty well guarded. And it is. It's guarded by zombies. There are zombies <laughs> in War for Cybertron. Um, Transformers that died in the wars gone by rise up to protect the AllSpark. There are great electrical storms and tornadoes around it. Like, it, it's not easy to get to, but you know they're going to make it. That's how this works. <laughs> Well, Optimus and the Autobots are able to recover the AllSpark, but the question becomes what to do with it. Before going off to find the AllSpark, Optimus goes to the Guardians of the planet. Now, the Guardians are just massive. The one that we all remember is Omega Supreme. When I was a kid, me and my brother had an Omega Supreme. The tracks, the wings, the rocket, we had the whole thing. And a Skylynx. Gone. <laughs> you ever think back to some of the toys you lost as a kid? You're just like, oh, God, I wish I still had that. Anyway, okay, I'm off topic. But one of them, amongst them, is Omega Supreme, just to give a frame of reference. He goes to the Guardians asking for their help to overthrow Megatron and the Decepticons before embarking on this dangerous journey to get the AllSpark. And they're basically like, look, we're the Guardians of the planet, not the Guardians of you. So this is a you problem. <laughs> this is not a we problem. Um, so, you know, Optimus is basically like, well, middle finger, middle finger, and goes off and gets the AllSpark anyway. Um, and he's able to get it. But the problem is, what do you do with it? You know, you get the thing, you, you got the MacGuffin. What do you do with the MacGuffin? So the plan now becomes to get off the planet. Bumblebee has had a little bit of a change of heart through the proceedings, as we all know he would. You can watch the series to find out how his change of heart came about. But he has his change of heart. He becomes a whole Autobot. He picks a side. And he discovers that there is an operational space bridge on Cybertron. And if they can get enough Energon together to turn it on, they can get not just off-world, but off-world and away. That's a horse of a different color. Okay. Well, that becomes the new goal. And... The only way they manage to get off planet with the AllSpark in their beat down ship with Teletram 1 that they've managed to keep hidden from the Decepticons all this time is because some of the Autobots stay behind to continue the fight for Cybertron. 
That's why we don't see the female Autobots in Gen 1. Because all of them, Alita 1, Moonracer, Chromia, RC, my favorite because she's pink. <laughs> all of them stayed behind to fight the fight. And they stay behind with some new allies and some old allies, but there's not a lot of them. But they're going to hold the line. And Optimus and the others who escape with him with the AllSpark manage to get the ship into the space bridge and are launched off into deep space. And that's how the first season ends. What's going to happen to them? Well, I'm finding out right now because I'm watching the second season and I'm really enjoying it. I've got some downtime coming. Uh, I have to have a procedure done. So it's going to give me some time to catch up on some shows because, you know, recovery time. So I might as well Netflix my life away during that time. Uh, but I'm excited to watch this series unfold. Uh, the second season, I'm into it a little bit. It focuses a lot on the Quintessons, which I love um, because they're one of my favorite uh types of characters in the universe. I hope we get to see the Junkions and some other characters, but we'll see how it goes. So I hope you enjoyed this review and introduction to Transformers. It's one of my favorite franchises. I'll talk about more series that are in this franchise as time goes by. My channel is very young and I'm new at this. So any view or click I get, I thoroughly appreciate. So if you made it this far, you might as well like, comment, and subscribe, and tell me what your favorite iteration of the Transformers is down in the comments.